Hi, I'm Reverend Greg and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In this video, we'll finally create the Bloom shader based on the blur shaders we worked on in the last few videos. But as always, a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths. So if you see any mistakes in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. Before coding, I'd like to show how Blooming actually works. So this is the mockup game on the application surface. The mockup is created from an asset created by Luis Zuno called Gothic Vania Town. The base project already has those assets included, but in the description of this video, you'll also find a link to Open Game Art and to Luis Zuno's Patreon page. The first step is to create a second surface with just bright colors in the game, pretty much like this. Here we're going to define a luminance threshold and everything above the threshold will be drawn normally and everything below will be drawn just black. But if we do it like this with a clear threshold and then dynamically change the threshold, colors might suddenly pop in or out. So we need a threshold range instead of this. I'm going to fade in the same image with a threshold range and you will see the difference in the darker areas mainly where some details will start to show up. With a threshold range we'll now be able to dynamically increase or decrease the threshold very smoothly. Then we'll need to blur this surface, but not by a lot. If we apply a heavy blur the blooming effect would be completely lost. We still need some strong contrasts with large black areas for the effect to look right. Once we got that blurred bloom surface we can combine it with the original application surface and draw them to the screen. Basically we're adding the colors of both surfaces like in blend mode add. Every pixel that was black and bloom surface keeps its color. But every pixel that had some brightness and bloom surface will get even brighter now. But this means the bloom effect will always only brighten the image. Depending on what you're blooming, a well balanced image can become overly bright very quickly. So we're going to add some darkness to the original surface like this. Now the darker areas will become a bit darker even and the brighter areas will keep some more details. Depending on what you want to do, this might look worse or better, but we'll keep it dynamic anyways. And to show how to combine this with other things we learned in previous videos, we're going to apply saturation just to the bloom surface. In example we can increase the saturation of the bloom surface and make everything look a bit more like Disney. Or we can decrease the saturation of the bloom surface and make everything look sad and lost like this. To visualize the drawing pipeline I prepared a chart again. So before blooming the game will be drawn to the application surface. The mockup assets I'm using are in pixel art style and so the application surface will be smaller than the screen by factor 3. In first post processing pass we'll draw the application surface to the pink surface setting the bloom luminance shader which turns all dark colors black. We'll set the threshold and the threshold range for smoother transitions. Then we'll do a blur pass to the pong surface. Note I'm not using the scale blurring technique here. I could, but since the application surface is rather small already due to the pixel art assets, I didn't feel like I need to and didn't want to overcomplicate this tutorial. If however I wouldn't use pixel art assets or use pixel art with subpixels, then I'd definitely also make use of the scale blurring technique to improve the performance of this post processing effect. Next of course is the second blur pass back to the pink surface, unless for some reason you want the bloom effect to go horizontally or vertically only. And then the final pass. We're going to draw the application surface scaled up to the screen using a blending shader and pass the bloom surface into the shader as a second texture. Inside the shader we will darken the color of the application surface, apply saturation to the bloom surface and then add both together. And the final result will be a bloomed game. But now let's finally switch to Game Maker Studio and make this happen. First I just want to set up and test a mockup game. After that we'll implement the bloom step by step. So let's start by duplicating the base project's template module and name it Object Bloom AppSurf 
because we're going to bloom the whole application surface. For those of you not using the base project provided with this tutorial, the tutorial will work without, but you'll need to create some basic stuff like a mock-up game and a user interface yourself. Next we should also create a new child of the template room, name it Room Bloom AppSurf, and move this room up to the top for now. Inside the room we can place the new object on the main layer. We won't need the trigger buttons or toggle buttons at all, so I'll just remove them. I already know we're going to need 7 sliders, so I'll just duplicate the last slider twice. Now I'm grouping them, so we'll get 2, 2 and 3 sliders. We won't need the automation button of the sliders, so I'll just stretch the sliders to fill the width of the GUI area and place a kill modifier across the area where the automation buttons would appear. Actually, for now, let's just stretch another kill modifier to cover all sliders and we'll get them back in whenever we need some. Now let's open the new object. In create event we can, as always, remove the information region. And we won't need the resize region, so let's remove that as well. In the title region, again as always, I set the title and info text. And in this tutorial I set deselectable to false, so we cannot deselect the test module by accident. In the mockup region we can delete everything except the script to create the low-res Gothic Vania Town mockup. With this script we can quickly test shaders in a mockup environment. It creates several parallax scrolling layers, plus a fake moonwalking player object, and it resizes view and application surface to one third of the window size because the game art assets are pixel art. All those layers will be automatically drawn to the application surface in the normal draw event, so we can then pass the application surface for post-processing in any later event. The last things we need to do inside the create event for now is removing the module sprite of the base project since we're not applying the shader to the module but to the application surface. And for the same reason we don't want the program to automatically draw the application surface after the normal draw events. We want to draw it in post-processing by our bloom shader. So let's turn off the automatic drawing by calling the function application surface draw enable is false. Now we won't need a step event for this. The module template step event is just changing mockups, but we'll stick to the mockup already set up in create event. So we can completely remove the step event here. In draw event we can remove the module drawing of the base project, since we're only using one module in this room, so let's remove script draw module. And since we're doing a post-processing shader we won't draw the bloom effect in draw event, so let's cut the code here and just leave a comment to not draw the object's sprite. To draw the application surface we'll need the post draw or any draw GUI event. As usually I'm picking draw GUI begin, so let's create that event and paste the code we cut from the draw event. And since we already disabled the automatic drawing of the application surface, let's just draw that surface in here now. We'll also need a cleanup event to re-enable the automatic drawing of the application surface so we won't mess up other test rooms. So let's create that event and call application surface draw enable is true. Now we can run this for the first time to see if our mockup game is working. As you can see the mockup is running, but since we picked the low res mockup, the application surface is too small to fill the GUI layer. So let's fix that by drawing the application surface stretched to fit the GUI. In create event just before application surface draw enable, we set up some instance variables to grab the GUI size. And in draw GUI begin event we can now use these variables to draw the surface stretched. If we run this again, the application surface will now stretch across the GUI layer. 
Now for the next step. As I have shown in the introduction, we'll need a second surface with only the bright colors of the game. So we need to copy the application surface onto another surface and do that with a shader that only draws everything that is brighter than a certain threshold. Let's start with writing the shader. First we'll need to create a new shader and I'll call it Shader Bloom Filter Luminance. The vertex shader will just stay a pass-through shader so we can close it. And inside the fragment shader I'll split the GL frag color line as I always do. As seen in the introduction, every pixel below a certain threshold needs to be black. So we need to get the luminance of the current fragment. And that's something we did several times in other videos before by getting the dot product of the RGB vector and the NTSC conversion vector. If you don't know what this line does, check out the fifth video in the playlist which is explaining gamma, brightness, contrast and saturation. To separate the colors below the threshold, we can use the step function and create a mix weight. If the luminance is lower than the threshold, step will return 0, else step will return 1. This means we'll need a uniform for the threshold. Uniform float bloom threshold. But I'd actually rather have a threshold range instead, because as mentioned if we dynamically animate the threshold, then colors will pop in or out very suddenly. So we can't use the step function for this. We'll have to use smooth step instead. Value 1 still is the threshold, value 2 is the threshold plus the threshold range, and the value to compare to still is the luminance of the fragment. If you need a reminder of how smooth step works, this function was introduced in the sixth video in the playlist, which was the video on duotoning. So now we got to wait. If the luminance is below the threshold, the weight is zero. If the luminance is above the threshold plus the threshold range, the weight is one. And in between, the weight is smooth stepped from zero to one. Now of course we'll also need the uniform for the threshold range, uniform float bloom range. This weight we can now use to mix black with the fragment's color. So we're mixing black and the base color by the mix amount of weight. The mix function shouldn't be hard to understand, but if you struggle with it, just check out the video on gamma, brightness, contrast and saturation mentioned earlier. That's it for the shader. We can now turn dark colors to black and leave the bright colors in. Back in Create Event, we'll need to set up the shader and its two uniforms. We'll set an instance variable for shader ID and uniform handles U Bloom Threshold and U Bloom Range. We'll also need a surface and later for blurring another surface. So let's just create both and call them surf ping and surf pong as in the last few videos. And while to draw the final result we'll use the already created GUI width and GUI height variables, the application surface and the ping pong surfaces will be only a third in width and height. So let's get those dimensions into two instance variables as well, application width and application height. Next we're going to create a new region to set up the sliders in the user interface of the base project. For now we'll just need two sliders, one for the threshold and one for the threshold range. First let's name two sliders with the script slider set caption. And I don't want to draw the values onto the slider and I'll use the script slider set draw value false for this. Now we'll need to add two sliders to the test room. Since I already arranged them earlier, all I need to do now is squeeze the kill modifier. And since we are going to create the surfaces, we also need to make sure they get freed in the cleanup event. And now we can finally get to drawing the bloom surface. In draw GUI begin event, we'll first need to grab the threshold and threshold range from sliders 0 and 1. Then we'll need to create both ping pong surfaces, although we're only using one for now. 
and now we can draw the bright colors to the pink surface. We'll set the shader. Pass the uniforms. Set the render target to surface ping. Draw the application surface and reset the render target and the shader. Finally, instead of drawing the application surface stretch to the GUI layer, we'll now draw the pink surface so we can see the first step of the bloom effect in action. So let's run this and see what the bloom surface looks for now. First, let's reduce both sliders to zero. Now if we increase the threshold all the way up, we can see how the darker colors turn black very suddenly. Now I'll reduce the threshold to zero again and increase the range a bit. This will fade out the darker colors more slowly than before. So if we increase the threshold now, the darker colors won't just disappear all of a sudden. They will fade out instead. So this step is working. The next step is blurring the bloom surface. We will use the techniques learned in the last few videos, but since this application surface is rather small already, I won't apply the scale blurring technique. So just a two-pass blur with linear interpolated samples like we had after video 15C, blur and GPU's linear texture filter of this playlist. We won't need a new shader for this, we can just reuse the shader we had called Shader Blur 2 Pascal Slur in video 15c. For all who didn't do that video, here's the code. The vertex shader was just a simple pass through shader. And the fragment shader was this complicated piece of code. If you'd like to understand how that code works, just watch the blur videos 15a to 15c, I'm not going to explain it here again. Now in Create Event we'll need to set up this shader and its uniforms as well. The shader as mentioned is Shader Blur 2 Pascal Slur. And its uniform handles and uniforms are for the blur steps, the blur sigma, the blur vector and the textile size. The way I'm setting this up, text size won't change, so we can calculate it right here. And since we're blurring a surface, text size is just 1 divided by the surface dimensions. So text size is 1 divided by application surface size. We'll also need two more sliders for the blur, blur size and a blur sigma. So let's set up those two sliders as well. And now I'd also like to set up some standard values for those sliders. The slider values range from 0 to 1. The first slider will be blur steps and I'll just set it to about a third of the slider bar, to 0.35 actually. The second slider is for sigma and I'll set it to 0.2. The third slider is the threshold and I'll set it to 0.35 as well. And the fourth slider will be the threshold range and I'll keep that quite low at 0.1, which looked pretty good to me. Now we'll need to add two more sliders in the room. So let's squeeze that kill modifier a bit more. That done, we can now get back to draw GUI begin event and to drawing the blur. Again, this is nothing new. It's pretty much the same as in video 15C. But since this time I don't need to compare the blur code of our discrete sample shader with the blur code of the interpolated sample shader, I can simplify the code a bit. First we'll need to get the blur steps. We'll grab the value of slider 0 and turn that into integers ranging from 1 to 16. And for the sigma we can grab the value of slider 1 but make sure sigma cannot reach 0. Now since we use sliders 0 and 1 for blurring now, I'll grab the threshold and threshold range from sliders 2 and 3 instead. Now we cut everything to draw the second render pass where we draw the bloom information stored on the pink surface blurred horizontally to the pong surface. Let's insert the second pass just before resetting the shader. We won't need to reset the shader before setting a new one. The function shader reset is only needed at the end when we tell GameMaker Studio to use the default shader again. 
First, since we're blurring with linear interpolated texture samples, we'll need to turn on the GPU's texture filter with the function GPU set text filter. In GameMaker Studio 1, the function is called Texture Set Interpolation. Then we can set the shader and the uniforms. Blur steps, sigma, blur vector, and texel size. After that, we'll set the Pong surface as new render target, draw the pink surface on it, and reset the render target. After that, we can continue with the third pass, the vertical blur pass. Again, like in the blur videos, we won't need to set a new shader, nor will we need to pass in all the uniforms again. Just the one that changes for the vertical pass, and that's the blur vector. And now we can set the pink surface as render target, draw the pong surface, and reset the target again. After that, we're done using the GPU's texture filter, and since the mockup is a pixel art game, I'll turn the filter off again. I just ran the program and noticed I made two mistakes in Creative Enter, so we need to fix that. The first is the order in which we define the sizes. Texel width and height depend on the app width and height, and therefore need to be defined after. And the second is a typo where I wrote slider wrong. So if we run this now, we should see the bloom surface as before, except that this time the surface can be blurred. Now we can finally create the bloom effect by combining the application surface with the bloom surface. The easiest way to do that would be drawing the application surface first, and then in blend mode add, drawing the bloom surface on top. If we run this, we got our first bloom shader. But we can do a bit better than this, actually. I want to get more control on how the two surfaces are combined and thus will create a shader to combine the surfaces. I want to add three more features. First, I want a slider for the bloom intensity. At the moment, we're just adding the bloom surface. We could control intensity by drawing the surface with draw surface X and passing in a gray vertex color to reduce intensity. But we could not further increase intensity like that. The second thing that bothers me is that this method is increasing the overall brightness and I want to be able to reduce the brightness of the unbloomed image to compensate. We could do this without a shade as well by drawing the application surface with the function draw surface X and passing in a darker vertex color. So we technically wouldn't need a shade for this. The third point is I want to show how to combine other effects we already learned in earlier videos. In this case, I want to change the saturation of the bloom layer and show how this changes the mood of the bloom. But of course, you could also add a contrast slider affecting either the base image or the whole image. Actually, you could add whatever you want to to get the mood you're going for. And last but not least, it's time to show a new feature. Passing a second texture into the fragment shader to combine the base texture and the second texture inside a shader program. So let's reduce the draw code to drawing the application surface only. We'll create a new shader now and call it Shader Bloom Blend. Once again, we won't need to change the vertex shader. And in the fragment shader, I'm going to split the GL frag color line, but this time with the varying vertex color on the last line. Now we'll need four new uniforms a float for bloom intensity a float for bloom darkness, a float for saturation, and a sampler 2D for the second texture, the bloom surface texture. The data type sampler 2D is something we haven't seen in this tutorial series before. It's a data type holding a texture. 
The built-in variable GM base texture we usually use to get the fragment color from is of that data type sample 2D. So it's nothing completely new to work with. And knowing this, we can grab the color of the fragment on the second texture as well. We just use the same function, texture2d, bit with the sample 2D of the second texture, bloom texture. GM base texture will be the application surface and bloom texture will be the bloom surface. So both texture coordinates will range from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And since both also have the same ratio and the same size even, we know that each fragment we want to combine has the exact same texture coordinates on both textures. Which again means the texture coordinate VV text chord can also be used to get the texel's color on the second surface, the bloom surface. If we would combine sprites, or if the two textures do not match in ratio, we would need to create a separate coordinate system for the second texture. And we will do that in a later video, probably when we get to Luma masks, I guess. Now combining those two textures is really simple. We just add the two colors. Base call dot RGB and bloom call. Note that I don't need to write dot RGB with bloom call because bloom call already is a VEC3. And adding darkness and intensity is simple as well. We can just multiply them in. So to darken, we will need a uniform lower than 1. And to set the intensity, we can now also use values higher than 1 and thus bloom more intensely than without a shader. Next we can implement saturation as we did in the video on gamma brightness contrast and saturation. If you don't understand the next two lines, just watch that video in the playlist again. Before adding up the two samples, we need to calculate the luminance of the bloom sample using the dot product and the anti-SC conversion again. And now we can mix the luminance with the color by the weight of saturation. So we're mixing a grayscale color with the original color. And that's it for the shader. Let's continue with the create event. In here we now need to set up the third shader and its uniforms as well. We'll store the shader's ID in an instance variable and set up the handles for the uniforms bloom intensity, bloom darken and bloom saturation and bloom texture. Here's the difference to the normal uniforms though. Usually we call the function shader get uniform to set up a uniform handle. But to set up a texture or sampler, we'll need to call the function shader get sampler index instead. The usage of that function is exactly the same though. We pass in the shader ID and the uniform sampler 2D variable name as a string. Later in DrawGUI begin event will also need an instance variable to hold the ID of the bloom texture. So let's define that instance variable here already as well. Next I want to set up the sliders for bloom intensity, darken and saturation. So I'm going to set their caption. And their default values. As default intensity I'm setting 0.5. In we begin I'll multiply the slider value by 2. So in effect we'll have an intensity of 1 here. As default darkening, I'll set 0. In draw GUI begin event, we'll inverse that value to 1, and since we're using this uniform as multiplier in the base texture fragment, this means we're not darkening with this default value. And as default saturation, I'm setting 0.5, but again in draw GUI begin, I'll multiply that by 2, so in effect we'll have a saturation value of 1, which means no saturation change at the default value. Now inside the room we'll need to add the last three sliders by removing the kill modifier. And in draw GUI begin event we'll start by grabbing the slider values for intensity, darken and saturation from sliders 4, 5 and 6. Then, again just before resetting the shader, we can add the fourth render pass, blending the two surfaces. 
First let's set the shader and the three uniforms intensity, darken and saturation. Now we need to pass in the texture to the sampler 2D. To do so, we can use the function texture set stage and pass in the sampler handle u bloom texture we created in create event and the texture ID. But we haven't stored the texture ID yet. If we have a look at the previous pass, we can see that the final bloom surface is surface ping. So we need to get the texture ID of surface ping. The most logical way to get that ID is when we create the surface. So all the way up, where we check if surface ping exists and if not created, we can grab the texture ID of that surface with the function surface get texture. Now that we got the texture ID, we can pass it into the shader. So all the way down again in the fourth render pass, right after setting the uniforms, we can pass the texture bloom texture to the handle u bloom texture, calling the function texture set stage. Now we need to move the surface drawing up into the shader block, so it's actually drawn by the blend shader. And there's another mistake we need to fix before running. When we duplicate the two additional sliders in the room, I forgot to move the new instances up in the instance creation order, and so setting the caption and the default value didn't work. All we need to fix this though is moving those instances up to right after where the other sliders are. But now let's run this and see how it looks. If we reduce intensity, we'll basically see the application surface without the bloom effect. And if we increase intensity, the bright colors get brighter and brighter. And that's interesting if you want to dynamically change the intensity. In example, if the player is in a dark room or a cave and gets close to the exit with bright sun shining outside, you might want to set a very high intensity and a low threshold for a short time and then bring the threshold up and the intensity down again as the eyes adjust to the sunlight. With the darkened slider all the way to the left, the bloom effect just brightens the bright colors but leaves the dark colors untouched. If we increase the darkened slider a bit, every pixel gets darker, but the bloom effect compensates by adding to the brighter colors. So what we can do with the darken slider is balance the brightness and contrast of the image to make it look more appealing. If we increase the darken slider all the way to the right, we are left with the bloom surface only since the shader then multiplies the application surface with zero. If we decrease saturation, the bloom will look pale and sad. If you'd also overlay a bluish color and darken it a bit more, you could imagine this to look like it just had rained. And uh, if we increase the saturation slider, the bloom looks cheesily oversaturated, maybe a sunset scene. So changing the saturation just on the bloom surface can help setting a mood without changing the color of the application surface. Now let me show you one last problem I'd like to fix. Let's move the intensity and the darken slider all the way to the right. I'm not sure how well you can see this in the video, but I can clearly see that the GPU's texture filter is turned off. That was intentional because it's a pixel art mockup, and we don't want pixel art to be interpolated by the texture filter. But I'd actually like the bloom surface to be interpolated, to get a smoother bloom effect. But that's a problem. We're drawing both the application surface and the bloom surface in one draw call and combine them inside the shader. Fortunately, there's a very easy fix. We can actually set the texture filter for each texture sent to the fragment shader. So let's do that final change before ending this tutorial. All we need to do is add one line in the draw GUI begin event. Usually we set the texture filter on or off using the function GPU set text filter, but that sets the filter for all samplers in the shader. However, we can set the filter for each sample individually by calling GPU set text filter ext and passing in the handle of the sampler 2D. In this case, U bloom texture. In Game Maker Studio 1 again the function is called differently. It's 
texture set interpolation ext, but the usage is the same. But just to make absolutely sure that the texture filter is off when we leave this room, I'll set it to false for all samplers in the cleanup event. Now let's run this one last time. We can see the application surface is still not interpolated, so far so good. And if we move both intensity and darken sliders all the way to the right, we can also see the pink surface where the blooming information is actually is interpolated. The blur here is very smooth now, so that worked nicely. So that's it for this tutorial. That's a bloom shade applied to the whole application surface as a post-processing effect. I numbered this video 17A for a reason though. I'd like to add another video on blooming with a code that allows to set the bloom intensity either per object or per layer. I'm not sure yet though because I haven't written the shader yet. I'm also not sure if it's going to be the next video. Really depends on how long it takes to get the code done in a way I'm happy with. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned some new stuff. I for sure learned a few new things while working on this shade and video. Until next time.